Max, what's the last thing you ate today? And a chicken sandwich. Cool. Welcome to the spectator. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Are you ready to begin? Yes. All right. Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. My name is Austin. And I'm Max. How's it going today, everyone? We're doing The Human Centipede. Yes, we are. Wow. I haven't thought about this movie in such a fucking long time. And I probably wouldn't have thought about it in a long time if it wasn't for one of our wonderful listeners. Yes. Who suggested this uh, after <laughs> they, they chose this movie. And uh, I should have prepared some documentation for all our other listeners who are maybe interested in making us watch any number of different weird movies uh, about how you can choose a movie for us. Right now, I think the process is if you donate $20 to One Fair Wage Emergency Fund.org, which I think is just OFW Emergency Fund.org. He'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. If you donate $20, and then you DM me the receipt on Instagram or you email it to Austin at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. Then you too can choose a movie for us to do. And you know what? Is anything off the table? We might have to set some ground rules. I don't know. But the person who, <laughs> the person, we'll think about that after the episode. The person who selected We'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. The person who selected I'm today's movie. I'm not watching movie, Serbian film for y'all. I'm sorry. Yeah. If it's going to be bad, it has to be interesting. Yeah. That's the new rule. Uh, so the person who selected uh, today's movie is Brian. Hello, Brian. Thank you, Brian. I know you didn't include your name, but I stalked your Instagram <laughs> until I learned your name. So hello. That's creepy. <laughs> It'd be creepier if I didn't say it. I'm addressing Brian directly you right now. You could have just used his Instagram handle. That's, that's It didn't a... have his name in it, Max. Okay. Now so... you're just being pedantic. I'll... Anyway, Brian, I'm sorry that Austin stalked your thing, but I'm very glad that you're interested enough on our podcast to... <laughs> Wanted us to do an episode. Yes. So you chose the human centipede and Max, I don't want to speak for you. Okay. Then don't, I'm not a big fan of this movie. Are you a big fan of this movie? <laughs> I'm not. Um, Whoa. I actually have a history with this movie. You have a history with this movie. Yes. You said nothing of this. Exactly. I've been purposely not letting it on. So I, Oh, who's the shady you. one now? Exactly. Ho, 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 ho. But when this was coming out was the same time when I was really getting into horror movies for the first time. Okay. And when it came out in Europe, because of the whole of details we'll get into later, it rode a wave of press, basically, to win some awards at some indie film festivals. Mm -hmm. So on the websites that I followed for horror movie stuff, I kept seeing this pop up. Like, this is what the premise is. Here are some stills from the movie. Oh, and it won some prestigious indie awards at whatever. And I'm just like, Ooh, okay. So it won awards. That must mean it's good. And that's a ridiculous concept. And I kept like telling everybody I knew about this movie. And then the movie came out and I'm like, Oh, and then I'm, I think I watched the second one because my friend liked it at the time. And I have purged most of that movie from my brain. Purged, you say? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Is it? I, I don't know. Do, I'm are just, we doing the purge now? No, do, just watching this movie and preparing for it just has me like thinking in the vocabulary of like bodily excess oh. in all sorts of different ways. But no, <laughs> even as a 14, 15 year old, I didn't really like this movie. I thought maybe because I like, I had seen like weirder body horror before. Yeah. And just like, oh, they poop in the mouth wasn't particularly great for me. But <laughs> it kind of was just like came and went. I'm like, oh, the human centipede. Cool. That's a thing. Ironically, this just entered your system and exited yeah. without any sort of continuation whatsoever. Or nutritional value. It did not enrich yeah. me at all. Yeah. But... It obviously left some cultural impact. People still will mention this as like a big body horror gross out yeah. milestone movie. It got two sequels. Like it made enough money to warrant that, even though that was always his vision to be a human centipede of movies. You know what? I'm sure it was. But <laughs> after that, like 
I haven't thought about it in years. Yes, in it's, years it's, and years and years. Hard to talk about it. Everything that's happened so far recording this week, it's like there's been this weird subconscious link between Max and I where like somehow it's like looking into the sun. It's like we're trying to prepare for the movie and somehow it's like very hard to like focus on it and do it because I think it's Max. My biggest problem with this movie is that it is boring. And yeah. I, ironically, it's going to come. We're going to mention this in the commentary track as a like subheading under it being boring. My other problem is that it doesn't really commit to its premise enough. And it's like, why is there not more shitting in the mouth? <laughs> that's why we're here. That's, that's like, that's the real problem with this movie <laughs> is there's not enough shitting in the mouth and you can quote us on that. And you know what? It's very bizarre to have a movie put you in that place, <laughs> but I think that's where I am. I think, I think that's where I sit with this movie. So yeah, I watched this movie for the first time shortly after it came out. Um, which was what, 10 years ago now, 2010 or whatever. In the U S I think it was released in 2009 in Europe. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I didn't really remember much except for how bored I felt then. Even then I was bored. And then now watching it, it's like, you know, I've seen Sallow now and I've seen the grand buffet and I've seen other movies where people like there's shit being eaten type movies, weird movies. I've seen all that weird shit and this one is kind of just like, I don't know. It's just a regurgitation of that. It's just the same thing I've seen except more boring. And I don't, I (laughs) don't really like, uh, sorry. No, keep going. Yeah. The vocabulary is there. I get it. Uh, but no, it's like this movie, this movie's only innovation is the human centipede itself, which frankly though, is an interesting innovation. It could have rode that wave to accomplish a little bit more. Aesthetically, it it's a cool looking monster. Um, it's a cool idea for a monster. Yes. I don't think it looks cool in the movie. No, because they do too much with it. I likened it the other day to the segment of Cabin in the Woods where they're in the headquarters and all of the possible monsters get unleashed and you just keep seeing cool different figures in the background. Well, theoretically you could make a movie based on any of those monsters. It works mainly cause it's like a mile a minute. Like it's a, a prop. Yeah. Yeah. This would be a great prop in the background of a different movie about a mad scientist that keeps putting people together. And but then you can't call it human centipede. Exactly. So if you're going to make it human centipede, I don't think the problem is that they showed it too much. I think it's what they chose to do. Yeah. It's constantly the problem. So, yeah, I mean, I think the real thing about this movie is that when people talk about the content of this movie, they're really talking about the premise of the human centipede itself in a more abstract way. And I totally get it. I totally get why the phrase like human centipede went viral and why it's a thing that like exists still like linguistically yeah and why it's something that we have this cultural reference point for but it's like you can just hear the phrase human centipede and if you don't watch the movie i don't think it makes a difference this movie should be like schrodinger's box where you just the schrodinger's box you don't open it but it has the label human centipede on it and then as long as you don't see it you don't know that is like boring and bad. You um, just have like the idea of the human centipede in your head. It's like that meme the from Modern Family, the dead dove do not eat and you just open it. And it's like, I don't know what I expected. It's that. It's not going to exceed your expectations. And honestly, it might not even meet them. And I know we're coming down pretty hard but on this movie, but we're still going to try to have a good time. Yeah, we're going to try our best. And we're also going to at least i'm going to try to bring up talk about some different body horror movies that i actually really like yes and give you reasons why if you did like this movie and i'm not going to fault you if you do like maybe it scratched some very certain itch for you maybe you you liked the doctor's performance maybe something about it struck your fancy if that's the case for you i'm going to try to direct you in the ways of other movies that I think are better made and might scratch that same itch for you. Yeah. And I, I can attest to that as well. And I definitely think though, I understand why people might 
gravitate towards this movie. Uh, but again, I think it's like whether people understand it or not, I think it's like, no, you're really like appreciating the concept of the human centipede more than what the movie actually does, does with it. Because for what it's worth, Max, I can't think of other movies that have an actual human centipede in it. Yeah, that's very true. So this movie did it and that was its novelty. And unfortunately it did not really capitalize on what is, uh, honestly a fairly like interesting concept. If you did it well, there's a lot of things you could do with the idea of a human centipede. Well, and we'll, we'll have to get into this more, but I don't, there's a lot of things I want to blame Mr. Six for, but I don't know if we can blame him for that. But for for the human centipede idea? No, for not, for it not being featured enough in the film, but that we'll get too. into that yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, So Max, before we jump in, I just want to say that we're going to participate in the metatextual dialogue of this movie, much in the same way that Tom Six directed this movie as the front of his own centipede of human of a trilogy of human centipede movies we are now the centerpiece taking a piece of shit into our mouths after which we will shit into the ears of our listeners <laughs> very true austin yes. very true is this is so much fun i can't wait so get ready Austiners. go yeah Austiners <laughs> listeners see it's perfect just shitting all over your ears Zippity doo da, zippity day. My oh my, it's time to poop in Austin's mouth. Cool, cool. <laughs> Sorry, it's that's that's how the that's this movie. Yep, six, six entertainment. entertainment. <laughs> Yay! So I was trying not to specifically talk about poop. No, Mister Six during our opening too much. But I've done a lot of research on uh, Tom Six. In preparation for this. Trying. Enigmatic figure. Yes. Um, <laughs> Tom Six is the director of this film, along with his wife slash sister. Um, <laughs> now they What's both, the deal with that? They post produced us. Uh, various sources. Some say that it's his wife, uh, according to a tweet we found from him from a couple years back, that it's his sister. But that tweet also had him say, hashtag thug life. Hashtag uber cool. Hashtag thug life. Um, Tom Six is one of those people that, if you like his work, it's probably good not to learn more about him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> God damn it. Because the more I've done research from him, I'm just like, you just seem like a gigantic asshole. Like coined the term. He seems like the Dutch Eli Roth where is that a term you coined? I haven't seen anybody else use it. So you haven't coined a term. Fuck you. <laughs> um, it's a comparison though. Sure. <laughs> But because I used to give Eli Roth like the benefit of the doubt for a lot of his movies, mainly being hostile in the Green Inferno, because the Green Inferno came across of just like, we're going to try to emulate how stupid those movies were. But then like you watch interviews with Eli Roth and he's just like, no, fuck those stupid SJWs. They're dumb. And I'm just like, oh, you're just dumb. And like, like unironically like old Italian cannibal movies. Okay. Well, he just seems to have no... Also, that photo, the, like the dog on the front looks very happy to be there. The other two are the only ones that don't seem to be enjoying the thing. Well, yeah. I would imagine so. I imagine that would be the case for most <laughs> It also people. looks like a very badly photoshopped image. <laughs> just saying. A lot about this movie seems badly photoshopped somehow. I don't even know if that makes sense. Like his glasses don't seem to fit his face. Honestly, we should. We, this is the one moment of the movie where we can really not insult it and harp on it at all. Because at this point in the movie, when I rewatched it this week, I sort of had hope. Especially in this moment, you'll you'll see right here. It's quite humorous. Uh, he puts the giant ass gun inside his masturbator trench coat, <laughs> as if it's going to hide him from carrying this gun. And he walks three steps with it before he takes it out again to shoot this trucker who's pulled over on the side of the road to be his first victim. Yes, which makes it seem like it might just be a campy, good, bad yeah, movie with a gimmick premise, which yeah. is not unheard of and would fit right in with a lot of genre movies. Yeah, the fact that he's not hiding it whatsoever is like terrific. It's like, it's a gag. It's playing like a gag. And then they do this weird ass shot where it's like the sun is coming over his face to the point where it's like... It's just like the sun just completely blots out his face because of how they exposed it. 
There you go. There you get the sun. It's well, you like, know they were shooting there. Like they had it at a low angle. Yeah. And the sun started to do that. And Tom Six was like, oh, that's so fucking cool. It's blocking out his face. Let's get that. And they would just put it in the movie. Well, I that's I what was, you realize in retrospect. Yeah. I, that, that definitely wasn't planned. There's so many shots in this movie that I'm like. That's just stupid. Yeah. Really, you lose hope in the movie. At least I did in this scene where we meet the two women <laughs> who I guess the point of all of this is just to introduce them as the most basic women possible. They're on the phone. Both of them are on the phone at the same time, Max. Women always talking on their phones. I bet they're shopping somehow too right now. They're going to the club. They talked about, oh, a cute German boy. And then they're going to Italy and Santorini in Greece for that Instagram. You love those pictures in Santorini. Also, they're in Germany. Yeah. In the year 2009. Sure. Even if Google Maps isn't as good as it was, or MapQuest still It was exi- still there. Yeah, MapQuest still existed too. Yeah, so did Twitter, so did so did You could have you could have found directions and then maybe like printed them out in the hotel lobby or something like that. Okay, yeah. You're getting into the other thing about this, which is a is a key feature of both of these characters, which is that I don't believe you, <laughs> Tom Six. Um I just these characters are so contrived to be our victims in every way possible that I'm like, I don't know a woman who would go on a trip to Europe with their friend and be as unprepared and stupid as this. It's like, it's like the, yeah, the taken movie. Yeah. Where it's just like the girl steps out of the airport in the literal second. She like, Oh, here comes the predator. Yeah. Whoop. Okay. But even that, it's like they had a cell phone and everything. And yeah. like, and in this, it's like they get lost immediately. And then they have no backup plans. They don't have a taser. They don't have like mace. They don't have like a knife. It's like, are you kidding me? Women get that so they can fucking get groceries because some weird guy is going to like holler at them across the street. And we could always talk about how obviously society shouldn't be that way. But I don't think Tom Six is trying to show us that. I think that it's just a... Are you saying you don't think this is a feminist movie? Somehow, no. <laughs> um, especially since our both of our female characters after this are muzzled by anuses. Yes. Somehow, I don't think so. Yes. Can we also point out the bizarre highlight on the friend character who is not in the driver's seat? How bright that is. It's like brighter than the sun. This is a very weird detail to me. They were shooting it normally when they first started driving, and then, and then when they cut to them getting out of the car, it was like the light that was on her face was like brighter than the light they were using to light the entire scene. It's a it's lot of weird. This, a lot of this is amateur filmmaking. Like you do get amateur vibes. It doesn't always look bad. It doesn't it's look just, bad, but like you can tell they're not entirely comfortable with a lot of the lighting that they're using. Yeah, it seems like something went wrong. Mm-hmm. Something bad happened. And then they had to improvise. Like, why is it so bright on her face, Max? Well, I think it looks like maybe they only had like one floodlight and like the other one broke so that they just. It, that's not even the problem, though. I'm talking about like them being lit in the car. I don't know. I don't know what it is. All I know is that I assume this is a low budget movie. And honestly, it mostly doesn't look too bad. But the more amateurish stuff has to do with like. The way they cut in and out of different shots. To me, we'll talk more about that later, but I get a very strong film school vibe from the way they sort of structure this movie from shot to shot where like I envision it on like an edit decision list and then like a shot list they need to get. And I just the way they went about doing it reminds me of a very like procedural, straightforward student film approach, which makes it feel like dead to me. Well, they're still well, talking about how they're lost. I have heels and shorts on. I'm not going outside. I guess, should we... Oh, God, this scene's going to go on for another 10 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. Because this pervert is going to show up. Um, <laughs> the most important character in the film. Yeah. That definitely needed to be here. And if Tom Six wasn't in control of everything, most assuredly wouldn't have been written out of the story because he serves no purpose. Well, you were hypothesizing that perhaps he's in here to to do two things. 
first of all, to somehow introduce some creepy tone in it. Yeah, because like you start off with the guy shooting the dude with a gun. And then for the next 10 minutes, they're going to be walking through the woods. Yeah. So maybe we need a pervert to show up and start <laughs> doing like saying like, oh, I'll fuck you. Mm-hmm. If it sounds like we're being very harsh on this movie so far, consider this, people. This movie is uh, called Human Centipede. So we know there's going to be a human centipede at some point. And then the first part of the movie until you get to this human centipede is like a timer, right? And right now, the timer is ticking. And we have now spent like at least five minutes of them being introduced as frivolous characters we're not supposed to care about. And then them in the in the car arguing. And it's going to go on for another five minutes until they find the house. At which point, it's going to take another five minutes for him to inject them and they fall asleep. At which point, it's going to take a bunch of time for him to chain them up, uh, basically go and kill the trucker, find a Japanese man, explain the, the plot of the human centipede that we already knew from us going to see the movie. Yeah. And then she's going to escape but then that goes on forever. But we know that she's not going to escape because the movie's called the human centipede. And we haven't seen a human centipede yet. Unless there is incidentally another human centipede. Yes. That like it becomes a home invasion movie. And then he's like, Oh my God, that's a scary human centipede. I'm going to make a human centipede to fight that one. And then (laughs) the, the, then when we finally do like, I guess we get what we were promised for, but we get it in very limited doses. Yes. It's just fucking boring. Yeah. And we'll get to that. But is the problem here genre familiarity for us? Is the problem that we are not the audience for this at this point? I guess. Because the thing is, we're watching this, right? And we know what's going to happen. And we're arguing right now that even if you hadn't seen this movie or you're not very familiar with weird exploitation gross out movies, you could anticipate what's going to happen in this movie based on the context clues that it's giving you. Right. But it's also like from moment to moment, you're you understand they are going to encounter this guy and you are now just waiting for it to happen. And we kind of had an interesting conversation about this where we related it back to some terms I think we last used in the Bird Box episode to talk about why the chronology of that movie doesn't work, where we used terms that were appropriated from linguistics, diachronic and synchronic, where, think of it this way, Max, if you're shooting home video, right, synchronic perspective is you with the camera as you're shooting your, like, family doing this thing. Diachronic perspective, that's you watching it back years later where now you have the context of history that's a distance between you and the event that's happening. Synchronic, you're in the event. You're experiencing it in the moment. Diachronic, you are outside of the event. You are more observational. I'll include some show notes stuff. Those are terms that are kind of sophisticated and appropriated from linguistics, but that's how they work. The thing with this movie, though, is that we sort of get, we are diachronic observers, right? Right. And this movie gives us context clues as to how each scene is going to end and what it's going to lead to. And yet it protracts the duration of time from when we learn what's going to happen at that point in the scene to when the scene finally ends and it happens. The duration between those two things is too long in every scene. If I want to, I've been very hard on you, Mr. Six. And I, I might have taken you down a couple of pegs. You might be Mr. Five now. Who knows? Hey, the first time that joke's been made. Ever. But I want to give him credit. Because in researching his development of this film, in order to get it distributed in England and elsewhere in Europe, he needed to edit out anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes of the human centipede stuff. Okay. And somehow I don't envision this movie as having a script that's over two hours long initially. Yeah. So I have a feeling they shot a bunch of stuff like as you should as a filmmaker. Sure. You should never film exactly what you need. You should let scenes play out and film more just in case that in editing you find out it doesn't work necessarily as well. But 
I have a slight feeling that to keep it at around 90 minutes, he stretched some scenes out with the bare minimum of what he could get away with to get it distributed. Yeah. Um, it plays that way. It yeah. really does. And I, I, I can't speak to exactly what was cut out. I don't know if you saw that in any interviews, if he referenced the scenes. No, it just, it was just more human centipede. Do you stuff. believe him? This well, movie was well, censored. The, yes. Yeah. It was censored. Um, Here's the thing. From what I've read in the interviews, I have no reason to doubt him. Okay. But if you look at a picture of Tom Six, I have every reason <laughs> to doubt him. He wears like a cowboy hat, right? Yes. And he's always in every picture I've seen him smoking. He's been smoking a blunt. Like I don't, I get it. Cool. You're from Amsterdam. Fuck you. But Oh my God. Does he act like, like the American teenager's idea of what a person from Amsterdam is. He's, yeah. He's in a white cowboy suit. And has a I don't know where that comes from, but I think it's just like him thinking that's the pinnacle of cool. That's a lot of things for celebrities. It's like, why do you dress that way? Because I, I'm rich and I'm allowed to, you know what? Side, side note, Max, that is the best thing about coronavirus is that truly people I feel like finally as a culture, we are grasping how like erroneous and stupid celebrities can be. You know what? It's just like, you know, yeah, they're stupid. Yeah. They're so stupid. Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger going and just like, stay home like me with my two pet miniature horses who I get to hang out with. And I'm just like, why do you have two pet miniature horses? Because why not? But at least he owns it. At least he's not like doing the like zoom background change thing to make it seem like modest house. I'm living in a modest house. Yeah. It only has like a fully, fully equipped kitchen and works perfectly. At least he's not singing. Imagine with a bunch of other celebrities. Yeah. Arnold, Arnold doesn't have time. (laughs) And for that, I appreciate him. But Max, we just talked over another really stupid thing where uh, they say, okay, let's walk away from our car. And then if we go for a certain amount of time without seeing anything, we'll just walk back to the car. Of course, when they said that, I thought they meant they would walk along the road, maybe in the opposite direction from whence they came. Yeah. Who was just like, oh, my car broke down. Let's go head straight into the woods. Straight into the woods. Which is insane. That's the kind of thing you expect to see in a low budget B movie from the eighties, because that was the only location that you were allowed to film was in the woods. Cause you didn't get a permit anywhere and your monsters in the woods, but at least they would also contrive a more convincing reason for them to be in the woods. They make a movie called don't go in the woods. <laughs> exactly. Right. Or they make a movie called human centipede and they're camping at first And then they stumble into the house. Or they just keep walking along the side of the road and they find this guy's house too. Yeah. Why do we have to have them run? The the point, this might seem like a small detail, but the point I'm trying to stress is that the amount of labor this movie sort of goes into to try to contrive them into the house is insane. These women have no backup plan. They have no idea what they're doing. And they decide to walk into the woods randomly until they by chance happen upon the house of the mad doctor. And I know it's not supposed to be important in a movie called human centipede, except for the fact that, that we've now spent like 15 minutes doing this. Uh, Also rest in peace, that guy. Oh yeah. He died last week. Max killed him. Unfortunately he had to, it was a murderous rage after I (laughs) rewatched this movie. So you can thank yourself for that, Brian. No, I do feel bad. I I did say, and Austin disagreed with me, and I can kind of see why, that he is the best part of this movie, but that's kind of unfair because he's really the only actor allowed to do anything in the movie. He's the actor who's given moments, but I feel like he's very poorly directed. Yeah, but like I guess just because there's a vacuum of anything human yeah, else in the movie that you're just like, oh... I recognize emotions. I forgot about those. I don't recognize emotion. <laughs> I feel like if he was a, a better actor, he would be able to like provide more there, but there's nothing going on subtextually in his performance. He's just giving like, uh, he, there's less ground than you think between his performance here 
And then Orlando Bloom is leg- legless, just like looking into the distance all the time. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, you know the story behind that, right? Is because nobody was directing Orlando Bloom. So he's just like, oh, they they didn't tell him anything. So yeah, he just, him standing there looking mystified yeah. was just how he felt. I always love that as like the best example in the same movie about what the difference in acting performance is when the actor is interacting with CGI and how they sell it. Where like you have Ian McKellen screaming at the flaming dragon and it's the most badass thing in film history. And he did that while he was, he messed up the line. Yeah. He said, you're, he said like, you won't pass was the line. And then he just changed you it. You shall not pass. And in reality, they were just shining like a light in his face. Yeah. And then you compare him to Orlando Bloom, where it's like, all right, Orlando, you're looking at the stuff. And he's like, oh, and he's just <laughs> squinting into the distance. And it's awful. Orlando Bloom can be a good actor occasionally. He's gotten better for sure. Yeah. To be fair, he was only cast in that, I think, because he was like pretty elf. Yeah. Boy, yeah. But imagine starting off your career straight out of acting school <laughs> and being with Lord, Lord of the, the Rings. Rings. Yeah. <laughs> what a legendary, amazing experience. I'm sure Orlando Bloom is cool. Actually, you know what? I take that back. <laughs> the second the <laughs> second you say that, Twitter is going to be like... <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he has some sort of Imagine video or whatever where it's like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> Didn't I just say 10 minutes ago we've gotten past how stupid celebrities are? Yeah. I always want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but you know what? I'm done. <laughs> I think Ringo Starr is okay. Ringo Starr is the only good celebrity. Why? Um, have you seen his MS Paint art? <laughs> no. What is this? <laughs> You've never seen it? Yeah, Ringo Starr's MS Paint art. Is this real MS Paint? Yes. What did he do in MS Paint? Amazing masterpieces. Don't show me now. Okay. We're working. As a put, no. They're really bad, but they're fucking hilarious. Does it look like that conjoined fetus artwork? Mm. Uh, no, that's a much better painting. <laughs> oh, Max, they've been drugged. <sighs> Thank God. I have a question for our women listeners. If you were in Germany, and I'm assuming you live in America... In the U.S., if you were touring Germany with Traveling your friend, abroad. yeah, and you got lost on your way to a club called the Bunker, and then walked through the woods to a random house, would you drink something that a strange man gave you? <laughs> that was exactly the question. Yeah, I was leading up to. Would you drink something without having seen how this person prepared it? After he previously told you that he doesn't like people, and that's why he lives alone. I hate human beings to quote him exactly. Oh yeah, that's right. Not even I, I'm not much of a people person or, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm a bit of an introvert. I hate human beings. I kill them whenever I can. I, I want to ward off the accusation that we're nitpicking this movie, Max, because my real point here is that in every scene that happens, it, it, just nothing happens. Well, that's the thing. A lot of these are small criticisms, but that's because there's no big criticisms. Like, yeah, the cinematography most of the time is ranges from poor to adequate. I mean, it's fine. Yeah, but it's never mind blowing, but it's never that like bad enough that like, you're just like, Oh, it does this. The structure is there, but it's, it's also plotting. It's boring and slow. Yeah. The script doesn't really matter because the majority of characters don't talk after the halfway mark. Yes. So there's not much to talk about there. And there's nothing about them beforehand. So yes, a lot of our criticisms are going to be small and sort of this here, this here, this there. But that's like the only subtext of the movie. Yeah. They have extracted all other subtext from it. That's the other reason why it really feels like a student film to me is because like you're saying, the script, the structure of it, it has the scenes you recognize that would lead up to the human centipede moment in this type of movie. But it doesn't really seem like there's any innovation or there's any point. It's like it's put in there automatically. And it also feels like it could have been 
a short film or that yes. maybe it was even written as a short film. Maybe. It just feels like there's a lot of filler. And it's weird because the filler doesn't come in scenes that are totally unnecessary. The filler comes in like how long it takes for each scene to play out. You know what I mean? You understand how each scene is going to end well before, well before it, in some cases even begins. Like, you know that he's going to explain to them what's happening or whatever. You know that they're going to get lost in the woods and he's going to get them, right? Now, Max, I was writing a different version of this movie in my head the other day. Oh, do And tell. I think it would be more interesting. Where instead of beginning the movie the way it is, where you have these two dumb ladies who get lost in the woods in scenes that could be like compartmentalized. Ultimately, if you wanted to, you could rewrite it to make all of that two minutes. Yeah. If you wanted to. What I would do, Max, is I would have them wake up in a hospital. And we have our lead character here. He's no longer brooding German man. He's a very congenial, very uh, affable and approachable doctor. And he says, please relax. You and your friend have been in a terrible car accident. Right? Yeah. And she's like, oh my God, thank you for saving us, blah, 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 blah. And then you make it this weird realization thing. Maybe she notices there aren't any other doctors or nurses. Maybe she asks to see her friend. Maybe she just gets curious or somehow. She begins to realize that somehow she's just on a set or something of a hospital and then when she moves, she understands that she's like in a fucking basement somehow. And she's very confused. And maybe the reason for doing that is because, I don't know, maybe it helps if people aren't stressed out prior to the surgery. Right, Max? But I feel like the process of her cognitively coming to an understanding that she's being gaslit into this weird like hospital setting is like more interesting to me. Because then you actually, it's still economical because the actors are still in the same place the whole time. But now, now you can make it more like, I don't know, about different levels of reality. And then the horrible secret of why you're at different levels of reality could be the human centipede. Yeah, but also like if you're adding psychological elements to it, then <laughs> you could also the way you do that, you could like give the doctor a motivation for wanting to make a human centipede. Yeah. Beyond uh, just, that's another thing. This movie is called the human centipede. There's a mad doctor who wants to make a human centipede. Yeah. He never tells us why he wants to make a human centipede. He just wants to, man. Cause the movie told him he needs to make a human centipede. Haven't you ever wanted to make a human centipede? Not permanently. Maybe on a g wacky Tuesday night after the office party. But yeah. Not not with stitches and anything. Yeah. Yeah, I uh I I don't know what to say. <laughs> you asked Austin. Sure. But that's another thing. We don't know his character motivations. We know he likes tying things mouth to anus and he seems to get sexually aroused by that. But yeah, or he sublimates his sexuality into that ritual of creating it. But okay, this is a great moment to egg like as a demonstration of how this is like film school aesthetic where we cut between the wide shot and then the close up every time he wakes people up. It's not enough to just do it for our lead character who I think is this girl, the last girl. She's supposed to be our lead. The one who's the middle piece. Yeah. Why don't we just cut into the center for like to a close up for her? So we'd know she's the lead, but then the movie would have to actually make a decision. And this movie's made on autopilot. So we cut back and forth between the wide shot, then the close up, then the wide shot, then the close up, then the wide shot, then the close up, back to the wide shot for every single person as he wakes them up. And then we draw out the scene so he can put on his suit again. And now he's finally ready to explain. Yeah, I love how he's dressing up to give a medical lecture about what he's got, <laughs> how he's going to make a human centipede. But why didn't he dress up before? Why is it as long as possible? Why do they draw it out as long as possible? 
Because we get it, Max. Okay, the projector is humming. He's going to explain. It's going to be like that scene with Mr. DNA in Jurassic Park. <laughs> and he's going to tell them what they're in for. If only Jeff Goldblum was here to be like, be like, ah, uh, you were so concerned about uh, whether or not uh, you <laughs> could. You never thought about <laughs> this. You were sure. So we would have been a lot shorter if Jeff Goldblum was here. Yeah. Another connection between this and Jurassic Park is how much those movies have <laughs> giant piles of shit. No, this movie has no shit in it. Well, none that you see. Exactly. Yeah. But you could have Jeff Goldblum here be like, that's a huge pile of shit. But why? Is this supposed to be a joke? Well, the thing is, like, we don't know if the Japanese guy can ever even understand him. I, that aside, do you think this movie is supposed to play as a joke to the audience? I don't know. The fact that he's so bad at drawing. Well, here's the thing. The first part of the movie isn't funny at all, unless like he was playing toward a European audience and like a very basic, like, look how fucking stupid the American tourists are. But even that could have done better. I love a good Americans are dumb joke. And that was a big thing going on at this time. I wouldn't call it a genre of movies, but it's like a premise that was popular at this time. I mentioned Eli Eli Roth. Mid-2000s, yeah. Yeah. I mentioned Eli Roth earlier. Hostel does a lot better job of explaining that, but... Yeah. There's lots of movies about American tourists going abroad and then people just like murdering them or whatever. It's a very cathartic genre for the rest of the world, and I can't say that I blame them. But also, like, I don't get that this is supposed to be comedic No, from the tone. but there are a bunch of weird moments later that are, like, played as they should be laughs, but it's just not funny. And I'm not trying, yet again, I'm not trying to be super negative here. But yeah, like, I just want to make it clear that our criticism is not, like, a more reactionary stance of this being, like, oh, it's stupid or it's gross. It's that it's bad at what it's trying to do. If this movie was like, if it fully committed to the human centipede idea. Yeah, it doesn't commit to it. I'd I'd be 100% on board, which brings me, uh, let's let's toss in a different body horror movie that I, this, let's start with what's widely considered to be one of the best ones, Um, at least from people that I talk to. But uh, go watch Society. That's that's a great one. If you want a movie that actually has themes and ideas behind it, and actually, we've been joking about how this is the the shit is passing through the power structure or whatnot. If you want a movie that actually has ideas behind it and a lot of amazing practical effects that really does focus on the practical effects, go watch Society right now. Well, also Society takes advantage of the metaphor of the horror that is at its core. Yes. Whereas this does not. There's a lot of ways you can talk about coprophagia is the term for eating shit. Austin had me Google that. Yeah. He refused to Google it himself because he didn't want to get ads. Yeah. Based on that. I think it was a good decision. Um, No, if you wanted to look that up, there's clear politics to that. The regulation of excrement, the ultimate abject subject like substance. You shit and you don't. You get away from the shit. Yeah. You don't shit where you eat, right? It's a phrase. It's an idea. Like shit is the pure abject thing that you dispose of and get out of yourself as quickly as possible. It's repulsive, right? So when it shows up in media, the eating of shit is something that can be um, very politically powerful. And I don't even mean that as a joke. Like there's a reason why Sallow despite being the famous movie about people eating shit is in the criterion collection. (laughs) In fact, I own it. Look right there. Oh yeah. Um, or no, the wrong side of that is facing us. But, um, yeah, I own Sallow. I got it from, I got it from my uncle who's very Christian as like a gift years ago. And I guarantee you, he did not know what it was. He just knew that I'm the movie guy. And this is a fancy foreign word. So. Yeah, sallow. Enjoy, Austin. <laughs> no, so, um, oh, I will say, interrupt myself, that that was a good moment. The gore of yeah, her ripping the... the, the IV out, yeah. yeah. 
Because that's very relatable pain, Gen- right? Gen- yeah, very, very visceral. Very like I, I get, I can relate to that. Yeah. Whenever you get gore that's like relatable pain, it always gets you more than just the visceral, like, I don't know, sight of somebody getting demolished, their yeah. body. If it's relatable in some way, it's always very brutal. One of the most brutal parts of this really, really incredibly brutal movie called The Prowler. Have you ever seen this? Yeah. Um, is when this girl's in a pool and then as she's getting out, the prowler, the killer, kicks her in the fucking face yeah. as she's like coming out of the pool. And it is so painful sounding. The boot hitting her nose and then the way the actor is like squirming in the pool after. The movie, the movie's brutal, but it has tremendous gore. That's like a masterpiece of gore, I think. But no, shall we talk about the politics? Of coprophagia, Max. If you really want, Austin. I mean, what have we got? What have we got to talk about? This is what we've got. Um, as far as this movie is concerned, I think you could actually utilize the human centipede image in a very interesting way. I think it lends itself to like a vaguely Marxist analysis of consumption. Anything having to do with coprophagia relates to excessive consumption because because shit is the abject substance incarnate, you do not want to consume it. It's the one thing you cannot acknowledge or consume. It's like the, 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 like, I don't know. It's the ultimate incarnation of what that means. The thing you do not want to consume. And yet these people are forced to do so. And I think it's interesting because you're basically taking them. And if you're doing the Marxist analysis, you look at the middle piece, right? And it's like you as the consumer realize you have no agency. Your knees, your tendons have been clipped. You can't move. You can't get out of this situation. You are stuck in this chain, right, of production and consumption. Now someone in front of you produces something that you are forced to consume, except it has no nutritional value. It has no use value for you, right? And it is abject, so it's repulsive to consume. And yet you still are forced to do so. At the same time, though, at the same time, you have no agency and you are caught in a chain. So you cannot leave this fear and you must also excrete something repulsive that someone else consumes. With even lesser value, honestly, because the stuff yes. you got, well, the stuff <laughs> you're later down the chain. So you didn't even get the remnants of nutrition that might be in there. Yeah, trickle down economy. <laughs> We're all just eating shit and shitting on the people who then eat our shit. See, we joke, but it kind of actually works like that. In the prep screening, rolling out this conversation, talking to Max about whether or not it make, made sense or I was just going insane, I used the example of my iPhone where I bet my iPhone is made with a uh, computer processing chip that utilizes cold hand that was mined by children in Africa, right? A lot of processing chips for computers use that. In fact, I'm going to say the vast majority I'm going to say plenty of people listening to this episode right now, you're probably using a like an Intel processing chip or something that that uses that like child labor, which is awful. And for me, that's kind of like somebody giving you shit. A company giving you a product that's shit because it uses child labor. And yet, I am also powerless to extricate myself from this wheel because for me, not having a phone like that would be a luxury. You know what I mean, Max? You, you would have to be able to basically support yourself without being in contact with the world because the entire yeah. society is now built around us using our phones. Yep, yep. It's like those stories of how Bill Murray doesn't have a phone and people just have to get in touch with him <laughs> like through his agent or whatever. It's like, yes, but that's a luxury. It's a luxury to not have a phone at this point. If you, you do if need you, one. If you put three Wes Anderson movies on at the same time, then you summon Bill Murray. <laughs> and that's how you pitch him yeah. Pitch him ideas. What do you think he thinks about The Human Centipede? Do you think he's seen it? No, I feel like Bill Murray has better things to do. Yeah, and that includes just drinking by himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I stopped by my parents' house recently, and they had just put on a... Darjeeling Limited. Oof. Yeah. I don't like that one. No, I rewatched it. Somebody once described Wes Anderson movies as having a long discussion with a beautiful man of, I enjoy, yeah, I enjoyed every minute of it visually, 
but I retained nothing after it was done. Having a long discussion with an annoying man who you do want to fuck, but yeah, you just need to wear earplugs. Basically. I understand it. I understand Because there are some visually great stuff in his movies, but like... I mean, his mood, that's never the problem with them. Yeah. It's everything else. My dad was making fun of me at the end because like there's that scene where <laughs> they're running to catch the train in order to get there fast enough. They have to drop their suitcases and my dad could just see my eyes begin to roll back into my head. And he's like, what? Yeah. Max, don't you get it? They're letting go of their baggage, Max. <laughs> don't you get it? I'm just like, oh my God. That movie is like even more torturous too because it like begins with Bill Murray. Yeah. Also trying to get the train and then he gets left behind and you're like, why don't we just watch that guy? <laughs> you're telling me I'm stuck with Adrian Brody. Owen and, Wilson. And what's the other Wilson? Brian Wilson. <laughs> nah, he's from, he's from the Beach Boys. What's the other? Who's Lamar Wilson? What's his name? Who's Owen Wilson in that movie? No. Who's the other one? I don't know. What's his name? He's in Legally Blonde. Brad Pitt. I'm not sure. Jason Wilson. What's his name? (laughs) Oh, my God. Charlie Wilson's War. Wow. What's his name? (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Luke Wilson. Luke. Luke Wilson. Yeah, Luke Wilson. Is he in that movie? No. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure he is. Oh, good. She got out of the pool. <laughs> oh, yeah. This movie's still going on. Um, let's talk about how weird it is that there's, like, blinds for his pool. I've never seen that. So moving on from that conversation. Oh, there's a sprinkler coming down from there. This scene is going on for a very long time. Especially since we already know that she's basically lost. Well, it's also because it is the thing you're saying where it's like this movie is called Human Centipede. And at the same time, it's proven itself too stupid to subvert our expectations and have there like not be Human Centipede. And also, just as another metatextual thing, because this film was like renowned as being so gross and like taboo. Yeah, you know about it. So, but like, that's the only reason people knew about it. Yeah. So, you know, it's not going to be one of those movies that's called The Human Centipede, but then it's just like, oh, this guy wants to make one, but he never yeah. does. And the it's real more human centipede were the friends we made yeah. along the way. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not going to do that. So, that's the other interesting thing is that do you think, I think the most interesting thing about this movie to me is its status as like that type of gross out movie that exists in the internet time frame yeah where it's not you know it still came out in the aughts so it's not quite the same as if it came out like last year however i do think it's more interesting to look at this movie as more of like an internet i don't know artifact and then how that changes the way you engage with it i definitely think internet really reshapes the expectations we have for movies when we go into them and it really changes what is possible to expect of your viewers if you're making a movie that's based on novelty or shock or surprise. I think it really, um, in many ways that are more challenging too. I think it's very hard to do. Maybe if this movie was made in the seventies, it would have some more crazy stuff going on. We were actually talking about this. Um, if this movie was made in the seventies, it would be the title of his like slide presentation that he gave them, which is Siamese triplets. But also, I think it would be way more exploitative. Yeah, there's there's some boobage in this movie, but like... This movie doesn't really sexualize them at all, honestly. I guess because like... Pooping in the mouth? I don't know. But then again... For somebody, I'm sure. But then that has no, that has less to do with them being like sexualized women than it has to do with just the act of pooping. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Do you have coronavirus? Yes. Okay. Super coronavirus. Good. Eight million coronaviruses, which honestly, I don't know how viruses work. That could not be that many of them. This is bad decision number one is going back for your friend. Should have just. Was that the first bad decision? No. 
but uh, since she escaped. Yeah, you could have just ran and called 911, but no. Or whatever the European equivalent of that is. I don't know. It's amazing how long the scene is going on for. It's amazing how long it's going on for without it adding any sort of new ingredient. You know they're just going to fail and you just are waiting for them to fail. This movie is really incredibly boring. <laughs> it really is, isn't it? Look at how long it took for her to fall down. It's just like every moment you see something happen, you start realizing how long it's taking. Is this is this the time image cinema that Deleuze talks about, Max? Is this the mandala? But like, there are movies... Mad Max Fury Road is like so much longer, but like I can watch that movie any time and just be like, wow, this is going by because too fast. things happen. Yeah. Let's dissect what we mean when we say things happen because we say that phrase and it immediately comes off as condescending, like we're talking down to this movie. But I really am trying to focus in on like why it is this movie is boring to us. And let's see right here. We're, we're, this is the procedure scene. He's going to perform surgery, right? So this, however, is a very generic scene that shows up in many horror movies. And many horror movies find a way to do it very interestingly and very fun. If you listen to some of our Hammer movie commentary tracks, uh, um, you'll see plenty of mad scientists there. But they always have some sort of very fun prop system set up. I remember in Revenge of Frankenstein, he has like a chimpanzee and guinea pigs and a giant pinwheel. This guy gives off, like, you could do it in, like, a House of Wax way, even, where it's just, like, make him, like, a sculptor or something who's just like, oh, I want to make sculptures out of human flesh, blah, 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 something. But even in just the House of Wax, I don't even know if we see a transformation, like, processing like this. You know what this is closest to, actually, is seconds. Yeah. But even in that, it happens much quicker, and... For that, they actually just shot an actual uh, plastic surgery going on. So that was more like cinema verite. But somehow even that seems more boring. I would rather somehow Tom Six manages to shoot an actual like plastic surgery or something to make it look like, I don't know, cobble it together in editing. In a montage, right? Make it look like what's happening is actually happening. But then you can also do the, these like gross cutaways to like him removes it, removing the teeth. Right. But there's nothing creative going on here. He's just showing you this basic stuff that if you watched like any horror movies, you've probably seen already. It's like, I get it. He just cut their ass. Okay. <laughs> and I guess it's supposed to be disturbing. Cause he's just like, Oh, but yeah, but then it just cuts from like that detailed surgery thing. And then it's done. Yeah, he did it. No lining up, no like horrific like that's the thing though. You would, you would think that like them slowly becoming conscious during the thing would be something or like him lining them up and stitching them together while they're coming to yeah. Something. You need an obstacle. You can't just like Also he's wearing Crocs. Yes. What are those? Instead, the montage is just basically still images of it. This movie would be so much more interesting if it was made like La Jete and it was just montages of still images. Of course, that movie also has the good sense to be like 30 minutes long. But that is such a good movie. Also, I do not like the decor of this house. I think the house looks okay on the outside. It looks sort of like, I don't know, it looks like stark, vaguely fascist <laughs> architecture, right? Um, but on the inside, it looks like a house that's being prepped for like a realtor to come in. And maybe it was. Maybe Tom Six had a realtor friend. I know he had apparently had a surgeon friend or something because that's another thing that he plastered on every poster for this movie when it was coming out which is 100% medically accurate. 
I think that was actually part of how they got it around the BBFC for censorship. It's like they made it seem like a medical hypothetical documentary <laughs> argument. That could be. I don't know. But he did have a surgeon who was apparently, from what I can gather from the interne- interviews, just like basically viewed Tom Six as a fucking weirdo who was just like asking about it for his own personal fetish. You extrapolated this from what he said about his conversations with the surgeon? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like it was basically like, because apparently the surgeon turned him down at first and it was, was like grossed out by it. And I can imagine if you just like go to a surgeon, you kind of know and you're just like, so if I had three people tied ass to mouth, how long would they be able to stay alive? And the surgeon would just be like, go fuck yourself. A surgeon would be like, I don't know. I'm not one. Yeah, I don't know. And two, I'm not here to answer your very specific fetish questions. I feel like that's part of Tom Six's problem. But then after they got some funding and Tom Six could like prove it was actually a movie he was making, the surgeon kind of got excited and did like a little bit of medical research to be like, oh, you could probably with an IV drip keep them alive for like seven weeks or something. The thing is, why would you listen to a surgeon? Yeah. This is Tom Six's problem. There's nothing creative in this movie beyond the fact of the human centipede. This movie is like transparent and the human centipede is at its core. It's like, it's like one of those stupid Damien Hurst artworks where he just like cut a shark into three pieces. Right. And then the, the shark is like in the middle of this, like it's, it's held in suspension in this giant box or whatever. And that's what this movie is. It's just a human centipede inside a box and the box has transparent walls. And it's like, well, there it is. And then the rest of the movie up until the end is him training his dog. I reckon the, the sequels are actually far. There's far more going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that. I remember almost nothing about the second film. But I do remember there's a meta textual thing where it the guy who's doing it in that film is somebody who watched the first human centipede movie and wants to create it, recreate it and make it bigger and better. I do remember some guy just being like, dude, the human centipede was only a movie. You know what though, Max? I also don't trust Tom Six. No, it's so not I'm good. sure he could find a way to make it just as boring as this. I really wish this took a twist right now and he's taking pictures and he's like, now we go to Milan and then he becomes a fashion designer and then he has the human centipede like doing the runways. Right. And he starts designing clothes for it. I'd I'd be okay with that. I would love that. Can you imagine if it was like Edna from the Incredibles? The best character with her human centipede voiced by Brad Bird, actually. No. Yeah, he did. So his his tr- voicing track for uh, Edna in that movie um, was supposed to be a temp track, and they were originally hired Lily Tomlin to come in and record the voice for Edna. And then when she heard it, she's like, "You actually got it," which is actually respect to. I don't know. I assume they paid her a little bit, but like to turn down an an, an acting job for a script that you like oh, yeah. accepted. Look at that. Yeah. Because you feel like they got the character. And you know what? She was right. They did get the character. Of course, that that character was based on the famous multiple Oscar winning uh, costume designer, Edith Head. Have we done an Edith Head movie? I think we have. We've done Alfred Hitchcock movies. So I think we've done Edith Head movies. Yeah. I mean, she was... uh... I think that's the best part of those movies. So Max, do you feel like the movie gives, who do you think the movie gives the most agency to in this human centipede? I guess the middle girl, like the top, Why? the top guy is constantly portrayed as just a gigantic asshole who 
<laughs> is impulsive and angry and kind of endangers the entire unit. Yeah. The middle girl is trying to put up with his bullshit, but also trying to comfort her friend. Well, it, back. do you feel like that gives her more agency or sympathy? I, I guess it just makes her most more of a character, but agency, I guess the front guy. I, that's why I feel like you could ground this in such a Marxist critique if you were going to make this movie in an intelligent way is because there's really no getting around the fact that everyone else has to eat out of his asshole. That's the thing though. Like what is, what does he want from this? Like he basically, the doctor you mean? Yeah. He seems, he just wants a dog. He wants a dog and he had three and then he accidentally killed them all. He wants a dog that (laughs) shits into other dogs mouth. Yeah. That's the other dropped ball on this is that his expectations of it are just the expectations of a dog. And now we're just watching it act like a dog. And we've, we've reached the point of the movie max where there's only one thing left to see. And that's the coprophagia. Yeah. Or coprophagy. However that word Shitting goes. in the mouth. The shit in the mouth. That's the last thing left to do. And uh, it's shocking that this movie is called Human Centipede, and the only thing it can think of to do with the human centipede is nothing, basically, except for the shitting. I mean, we get some things later with, like, them attempting to finally work together as a unit to climb upstairs. Um, I wish there was so much more of that, where it's like they have to sneak out at night. But there's no interaction between them learning to work as a collective. That could have worked so well, again, as a Marxist analysis where they collectively have to, like, rise above their class positions. By that, I mean which yeah. order they've received shit in this, like, giant shit train. Um, but no, the movie doesn't do that. There's no attempt for them to interact with one another. They go through so much effort to, like, subvert the need of, like, writing did you notice this? Like, you know how we talked about they could have compartmentalized the entire entrance of those two girls where they're walking through the woods if only they had bothered to write it in a way that made sense? They could have avoided doing all the work of shooting them driving down the road, shooting them walking through the woods, shooting them walking up to the house. They could have worked all around that if only they had found a way to make it make sense. The pit thing I pitched you, right? Yeah, I'm could. not a good writer, but if she was like, if it seemed like she was waking up in a, in a hospital, right? That's even more convenient because now you can only shoot one place. That's perfect. You don't even have to go to the woods. And also it makes it so like assholes like us aren't constantly being like, well, the, the, it's just go in the woods. If you wake up, we don't know where they are relative to anything. You, we can just be like, oh, the house could be anywhere. Yeah. This could be a bunker down like somewhere. We don't know. But. Yeah, and it heightens your sense of dread because you have no idea of how how bad the stakes could extend to. As far as you know, you could be in like a completely different foreign country and this could be a military sanctioned op- operation. We need to know what the best way to shit in other people's mouths is. <laughs> the Chinese already have human centipedes five people long. We need to beat them. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a great, a great like satire. The Russians have developed a human millipede. We must outdo them. Can you imagine them training armies of human centipedes? Doing like synchronized swimming. Maybe that's what uh, the third one is about. Now the third one takes place in a prison where they just take all the prisoners and put them as part of a human centipede. Okay. But I think... How human caterpillar is a thing that's coming out. Or That's something he said was coming out, right? Yeah. In which case, like, why? You've already... Human centipede is the thing. That's the idea. From what I under... Oh, here we go. Oh, here's the shit moment. As, exactly as random and, and, like, coming out of nowhere is our shift in conversation. So clearly he's getting off on this. Yeah. This is the thing he's been waiting for, the feeding. Clearly he gets sadistic, misogynistic pleasure from this. He says, swallow it, bitch. 
and this is the the feeding. You know she's slamming against his ass, so it must be coming, and then we cut away. And Max, I was furious. Because you know what we need in that moment? We need to push in on her face, and we need to see her swallow it. And we need to see her, just the reaction, the actual emotional damage it's doing. Let the actor do it. Yeah. Let the actor play the scene as eating shit. As far as we know, the only as far as she gets, it seems like they, she's only just coming up to like the point of eating shit. We need the full thing. We need to see before as it's starting, at in the middle as it's happening, and then after it's done, the look of regret and sorrow. We need the whole thing, Tom Six. And I know it's weird to have that complaint. That's a very bizarre complaint to have, but that is the whole point of this movie, and you just cut out of it. This movie has nothing but its gimmick, and yet you cut away from the gimmick in the only idea that it had. Oh, and it's disappointing. Which brings me to a movie that I've brought up numerous times in the Spectator yeah, Tater Film Podcast before. But I don't think I've ever formally recommended, uh, mainly because it's a hard movie to say is actually good because it's kind of stupid and ridiculous. But I do generally love it, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Uh, I don't think Austin will necessarily agree with me on this endorsement, but I love Tokyo Gore Police. I think it's... If you want a gross out movie with special effects bonanza that really just keeps going with its premise and shows you disgusting shit over and over again and does not flinch away from showing you that disgusting shit, then go watch that movie. Uh, it's what happens when you give a special effects artist a budget to make a movie and he has no business in showing you... yeah. Tell me, yeah, making a movie, but he does it anyway. Yeah, I do disagree with that movie being good. Yes. Um, I never said it was good. I said it was a better than this. It is better than this. The reason being is that he's a special effects artist. Yes. So he visually really like, he really like ravishes the opportunity to just do weird, gross things. Yeah. But he comes up with different set pieces around that. And also, I bet he would love the opportunity to do a human centipede type thing. Yeah. However, he would also find ways to make it more visually engaging. And he would also explore the idea of the human centipede more. I'm sure there would be like a laboratory where there's lots of failed human centipedes in this. Yes. And he would really give you the opportunity to explore that premise much more. Even on like a lower budget, I think he would do it more. Because I think he's more interested in the prop and really, ultimately, this movie, all it has is the prop of the human centipede. But because he's a special effects artist, he would care more. Yeah. Yoshihiro Nishimura is great about that, at least. Yeah, I think the rest of that movie <laughs> is probably just as like dumb as this. Only he's more interested in the rest of that. that. The rest of that movie, there's some problematic stuff in Tokyo Gore Police that stops me from being... All I remember are the gore scenes, and then also like... He's like just copying RoboCop. Yeah. Don't they have the same exact TV show where he's like, I'd buy that for a dollar? Not the same exact, but there's a lot of similar tone stuff and satire. Um, also now like self-harm is like a chic thing. What? There's like commercials of like Japanese girls like selling you tiny razor blades to cut yourself with on the TV. Oh, like that Netflix TV show yeah. that everyone was worried about? Yeah. 13 reasons why yeah fuck that oh no the one who only gets to eat shit the second time around isn't that healthy who would have thought you know max the more i think about it the more i would be really angry if i was the girl <laughs> actor in the middle it's like you hired me to do this job and now no other actor has had to act this in like a movie Think about how unique that is. How many actors have to like physically perform the act of eating shit while your face is sewn to shut someone else's asshole. And now it's cut out of the movie. I don't know if they had to cut it out for censorship reasons or what, yeah. but I would be like, damn it. This is the only movie I'm going to be remembered for now. And I don't even get the opportunity to play this admittedly gross, but honestly kind of unique acting moment. Yeah, and that could have at least, like, got her positions in other horror movies. Sure. Like, That's something that I always find very interesting in horror performances particularly is, you know, the idea of, like, 
understanding performance and expression of performance and how important it is in horror movies for actors. We were joking about Legolas and Ian McKellen earlier, but it is really important for actors to sell different moments, even more so in horror movies where, you know, they're often interacting with something that's supposed to be supernatural or doesn't exist really, or is maybe just a special effect and they have to sell the fear of it because they, even more so than a movie like a fantasy movie or a sci-fi movie, they have to channel emotion in a more precise way. And this movie kind of robs that actor of that opportunity to do that in a way that I feel kind of like, I feel bad for her. <laughs> uh. Oh, is this the police? Yes. Yeah. We're coming up sort of on the end. Oh man, the police. I love them. They've put out some great songs over the years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Should we also talk about how your jokes are shit? <laughs> and then it's like you're you're feeding the podcast listeners shit with your jokes. No, I'm feeding you the shit. And then you get to slow down the podcast by pointing out their shit. And then the audience gets to listen to that. You know, I've read some interesting criticism on this movie. And I'll include some of it in the show notes. But... Uh, one of the interesting pieces of criticism I, I found, actually, you know what, Max? The coolest thing about doing this episode is I found two open access journals, which is great. Okay. And they're both on like horror movies. I love it. One is called Monstrum. And then the other one, I believe, is called The Projector. Although I don't think The Projector is about horror movies specifically, just this this one issue. But uh, some of them, some of the work on this movie was kind of interesting, even though I feel like in both essays, they were analyzing more the like abstract idea of every scene rather than the scene itself where they did not take into account how boring it fucking was. So when they talk about the affective properties of this movie, it's like, I'm sorry, it doesn't have affective properties because one, it cuts out of the grossest scene and two, every scene is so boring that the only affective thing it does to its audience is put them to sleep. Yeah. So if we're talking about it, we're talking about it in the abstract. And I think, why did I bring that up? Oh, who cares? You, the police came to the door and you said that. And then you made that joke. You had read some interesting. Horror. Yeah. Oh, okay. So here's why I brought up one of the interesting things I found was sort of this take, um, about how this movie is sort of like, I don't know, in a more metatextual way, maybe if you take into account the sequels, um, it's almost like a commentary on excessive proliferation of media. Okay. If you, I think if you specifically look at the second one, where it's like, think about how much shit is produced today. And how huge audiences are now. Max, there are TV shows that neither you n you nor I know about that have huge audiences and have been going on for like six seasons. Well, yeah, that's like whenever you see on Twitter where it's just like, this person was canceled for saying that the Nazis were the best people ever. They had an audience of 25 million subscribers on YouTube. I'm like, I've never heard of this person in my life. Yeah, and that's just like Instagram influencers or whatever, yeah. yeah. And meanwhile, there are also like TV shows like Vikings. Have you ever seen anything related to Vikings? I, that TV show? Occasionally, but that was mainly because that was suggested ads when I used to watch Game of Thrones years and years ago because they were trying to convert me. I think it's still going on. No, it is. It's outlasted Game of Thrones by now. But that movie, has, that show has like a huge following. Yeah, so does Supernatural. Supernatural had like 80, it just finished. It had like 80 million seasons and it's, I just, I, I don't know. It's very bad. Yeah. I'm so sorry I, to I, all the supernatural fans I know out it's, there. it's technically not this movie, Max. Yeah. But I think there is maybe an interesting, I don't know, sort of examination going on perhaps, perhaps in the sequel that I haven't seen about like the idea of consuming shit media. And then the excessive production and consumption of that media, because that's really what like poop eating movies always come back to Ugh, is like the great genre of poop eating movies. Yeah. Like consumption and production. And when those things become ex excessive, they become abject. They become repulsive. I 
I think it's so weird that he's talking to police like this. Well, was this supposed to be set up earlier when she spilled her drink and he just freaked out to show that like he's not stable, he's not cool and collected? I guess, but like... I guess the thing is that he's incriminating himself gravely. If these were American police, they would have shot him by now. <laughs> uh... Yeah, if you, like, sneeze at an American policeman the wrong way, maybe he's because he's white, that makes a huge difference. But even still, yeah, you don't, like, go up to an American policeman while your hand is shaking from rage and be like, finish your drink and get the <laughs> fuck out. And also, this, like, this scene writes itself. This is the scene where, you, like, the people down below, they can hear the police. That's the police such a good point. The police yeah. can't hear them. And they're trying to make noise or get their attention. And the police are just like, hey, Dr. Jenkins, I heard that we're looking for these two American tourists that have gone missing. And, you know, we got to check with everybody in the neighborhood. Just a routine check. You know, we don't really suspect you're a good surgeon guy. You helped both of my daughters. Yeah. And are you coming to the barbecue on the just when you think that they're going to actually get their attention? They don't, and then something goes wrong. Yeah. That scene writes itself. Yep. And yep. now we know that they're coming back with the war, and it dissolves more dramatic tension. And then he even has the patience to be like, oh, I'm going to get I'm gonna get some more of them. Do you think there are only two police in all of Germany? <laughs> I don't know how Europe works. Maybe it is that much more peaceful. That they only have two. And they don't even officers. wear their uniform. <laughs> they just no wear uniform. plaid. <laughs> that is their uniform. <laughs> but that's another thing. It's my problem with the absolute end of this movie as well. Is it doesn't make any sense. Why? But because it's supposed to be portrayed as like this horror that like she's caught between the two dead ones and she's going to die yeah. like, in the middle there. Yeah. But she's not. Because, like, the police will notice that those other detectives didn't report back pretty soon. Or their families. Yeah. Somebody's going to notice. I bet they could find the car. Yeah. Unless they those two cops were, like, secretly having an affair <laughs> and then also decided to hassle this guy on the side. Unless they weren't cops, but, like... <laughs> more people are going to show up there is what I'm saying, basically. So that girl's going to be fine. She's going to be traumatized and she doesn't have teeth anymore. But that's, I mean, you know, George Washington didn't have teeth. I mean, he stole teeth from black people, but yeah. <laughs> My point is that it wasn't a huge problem for him. <laughs> Maybe if he had been part of a human centipede. That was, that was a, I brought up that show masters of horror before that was an episode. He George Washington in the human centipede. No, but, um, it turns out George Washington was a cannibal. Okay. Because during one of the battles, he had to start eating his own soldiers to survive. That Is was... that like ravenous? Kind of. Oh man. I can't wait to do ravenous. <laughs> ravenous is so much better than this movie. <laughs> Seriously. If you take one thing away from this commentary track, please watch ravenous. It was the only movie directed by that woman. And it was such a clusterfuck. Or at least I believe it was the only movie she directed. But it was definitely a huge clusterfuck, that production. And yet the movie is so, so good. Did he just threaten to call the police on the police? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and how am I supposed to be scared of this fucking asshole who dropped his syringe in front of the police where he's like, and then the police picks it up. He's like, what's this? And he's like, uh, insulin. I have done the diabetes. I wasn't going to rape drug you. This needs like a slide whistle. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. it's like the, uh, what is it? The fucking uh, 
the price is right. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I dropped my <laughs> syringe. <laughs> well, that's awkward. <laughs> that was stupid of me. Sorry, police officers. I'll just go. God, this guy needs to stop having baby art everywhere in his house. It's becoming a problem. Why does this house have landlines on the wall? <laughs> it looks like a hotel. Like a hotel has landlines on the wall. Maybe it's like a rent. Maybe it's like a rental house. Like you can. Maybe it's like an old folks' home, and it serves a lot of people. Oh no, my human centipede! <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> that's the that's the type of thing that like you do that like slow actor turn and pan when like the monster's going to be like on the ceiling or behind him, which would have been fucking hilarious if it was like the three of them hanging from the ceiling and <laughs> dropping down or something. But that's not uh, God. Where were they hiding there? No, no, no. Oh wait, is this the end of the movie? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, not complete end yet, because we have to wait for them to try to get up the staircase. Yeah, it's going to take another 20 minutes. It's going to take another eight years. and But, like, now it's finally happening, the end. <laughs> and this is the first time they're finally going to work together. Yeah, I really would have appreciated if they'd tried to, in some sort of Marxist way, become a collective. Also, why the fuck did you stab him with a scalpel and leave it in his goddamn knee instead of killing him? What the fuck? Because Everything this movie does with their characters is just terrible. It's the most contrived bullshit ever. It really is. And it's like... I, I am curious... If you do like this movie, genuinely, and not just like in a novelty, oh, well, that's gross, or ironic way, if you genuinely like this movie, please let us know why. I, I would be interested to hear why you think this movie is good. Yeah. Also from Brian, like... What, maybe, ma what made you want yeah. us to... Yeah, that's actually an interesting thing. Yeah. We brought up good old Brian the entire time. Well, I guess the thing is, like, we've never done an audience yeah. suggestion before. It would be nice. You know what? I'll add an addendum in the show okay. notes to this. If you want to suggest us a movie, you can give us a little bit of a synopsis. I know, Brian, you sent me an Instagram message um, saying, like, oh, it had some good stuff in there. But we didn't really get a chance to, like, get much of your opinion on a lot of it. And... I would be curious because now I wonder if there's something that you saw in this movie that we completely just missed. Or yeah. Like if you put on dark side of the moon to this movie, it actually <laughs> becomes, <laughs> that is apparently you can do that over Paul Blart mall cop too. And it syncs up perfectly. But really? I, att I attribute that to being the editor being a 23 year old intern who was not being paid enough and was just like, fuck it, I'm going to sync this movie up to Dark Side of the Moon because I'm Is bored. Is that a joke or for real? Apparently it syncs up perfectly. So it's yet another one. Was that one they did deliberately, though? No, I I just attribute... Um, that's what I'm saying, though. I, I assume that's how it happened. Is some bored intern. Does it sync up, though? I can't tell if you're joking or no, not. No, there's videos of... Like, I've been drinking this entire time. <laughs> we We both have. I guess nah. I'm not scared of him just because he licked some ass blood doesn't mean I'm more scared of him. He's still crippled. He's just boring. Yeah. We didn't even make fun of that guy's Playboy bunny tattoo. <laughs> Why does he have that? Oh, now he's great. Gray wolf Sif. This movie has no sexuality in it whatsoever which is maybe for the best. But also, if this movie is just trying to be as shocking as possible, it just feels like, I don't know, there's just nothing to talk about. There's nothing to talk about other than the image of the human centipede itself. Yeah. And once you've had that conversation, you don't need to see the movie. Yeah. 
in a weird way, it feels like this movie is like fan fiction for Human Centipede 2. Where it's like Human Centipede 2 is the real movie and this is just the thing that that guy watched. I don't know anything about Human Centipede 3, but like, is that like the plot of that movie? Like the government saw the Human Centipede 2 and was just like, oh, we could do that to decrease the cost of feeding our prisoners or something. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like a much better place to start for yeah. all this because now it's like a Jonathan Swift premise. It's like, what don't we, why don't we just make it a human centipede? Forget having to feed the homeless. Yeah. We'll make them one we'll feed, homeless. We'll feed one homeless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we'll give him really good food guys. This is a part I'm mad about. He puts down lamp to get shard of glass to fight the dude. Shard of glass. This guy already has less range. I'm questioning your fighting ability, Playboy Tattoo. But also, like, why don't you just escape? Why don't you just clock him over the head with the lamp, is my question. Yeah, he's got a scalpel that's sharper than your piece of glass. And then he heroically decides to kill himself. Yeah. Do you think that's racist at all? I mean, besides the fact that they've been calling himself Mr. Kamikaze the entire movie. That's the other weird thing is like the weird post-war yeah. thing onto this, which is like, what? I mean, he calls him a Nazi. and it's, That him. makes more sense. Yeah. That makes more sense to have and like... We haven't talked about that much that this character is very much like a... Joseph Mangala type German doctor type thing. That you say very much, but still it's like barely because the movie doesn't explore it. It's cultural shorthand. I think is the point. It's yeah. Like, everything in this movie is cultural shorthand Yeah, because this movie interest isn't interested in elaborating on anything. Dr. Moreau from Island of Lost Souls is much more of a Nazi than this character. Yeah. And I like Moreau. Yeah. Moreau also is interested in mixing the boundaries between animal and human, just in a, in a more intelligent uh, way. And by that, I mean the movie does it in a more intelligent way. Moreau does it in a more, like, true-to-life way because it's actually, like, investigating ideology. This is just... I don't know what this movie is. This is I'm Still a Human Being but yet no one around him understands. In a weird way, he has like the same amount of like agency as the other two because no one understands him whatsoever. He can speak, but no one hears him. But at the same time, there's really no getting around the fact that he doesn't have his mouth sewed to someone's asshole. <laughs> and by him doing this, he endangers both of the other girls. Yeah. Like, this makes me hate him. Yeah. And she's... And I, I get it, like... <laughs> do you get it, Max? I get... He's insane. Like, this would be a, tra a traumatizing experience, and I can't say how I would react. But as you said, he also doesn't have his <laughs> mouth <laughs> stapled to somebody else's ass. This movie is fundamentally materialist, because there's no getting around the material reality of having your face stapled to someone's <laughs> asshole and really like he you could say like you, okay yes it is traumatizing max but he didn't have like his chin altered yeah. and like he didn't have to swallow shit <laughs> and all like he did get his tendons like snipped so he could not walk again and he does have a weird asshole now <laughs> but also like which is unfortunate i mean this movie was made in 2009 if you were a victim of a human centipede crime, that would probably go viral. It'd be like on last podcast of the left or something. And, uh, I think you could probably afford one of those like mechanized, these amazing devices, Max, these like mechanized limb things. Have you seen these where some people use them in packaging in industries? It's basically like mech 
technology where it's like, it's a thing that helps you like move heavy things. Oh yeah. People use this, I'm sure for therapy. Maybe you could do something like that. My point is that he doesn't have like his face altered. These two women have their faces altered. Frankly, I'd be much more interested in trying to see a woman like in, in a movie, like overcome the fact of being a victim of a human centipede crime. But here we go. The final chase. Here come the cops. With two identical looking cops. They are identical looking. <clears throat> and the editing in this sequence is kind of like nonsensical. It cuts back and forth between in, in like very weird ways. And because they look the same, it's very easy to confuse them. And I don't know what he's seeing here that's making him vomit. Maybe he's smelling something. This movie has very poor conveyance of, of all factory yeah. sensation. Whereas people can talk about like, like synesthesia or whatever of this movie and how repulsive it is to see the image of swallowing shit. And how like it out of reflex makes you like, feel like you're also swallowing shit. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But this movie doesn't do that. I think, I think movies like, again, exploitation movies from the seventies, stuff like Sallow, they're much better at doing that because they're made by people who are actually good at filmmaking or a movie like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I smell that movie. Do you know what I mean? Yes. 100%. Jesus Christ. And that's why I love that movie. And part of it is because of the mizzen scene of how they made that where it's like, yeah, it fucking smelled. There were people who were Vietnam veterans who, when they were making that movie, said it was worse than Vietnam because they had to shoot the bright lights in a hot Texas day on like the disgusting, decaying food in this kitchen. And they had to stay in there for hours and then they would run out and vomit. Whereas this movie has the mizzen scene of like a kid, not a kid's movie, a, a student film. Yeah, it really does. It never does anything interesting with the light lighting. It's yeah. always just very washed out and uninteresting. I'm glad we did that John Cocteau episode because I think when we talk about La Belle at La Bette and John Cocteau's filmmaking practice, it really hammers home the value of a specific method of production and how a movie is basically a documentary of its own making. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Yeah. Where it's like how you make the movie is what it is at the end of the day when you play it back. And maybe the reason this movie isn't really engaging to us is because they didn't make it in a way that was engaging. They made it in a way that I recognize as like student film esque. I don't find it particularly bold or gross or anything. You don't have little radios. You can be like other police officers calling for backup. Yeah. No, this hammers home my theory that they're not actually police. <laughs> I love how I want to watch that movie of, the, of these cops who just happened to stumble into human sense. That would be a more interesting movie. Yeah. <sighs> We're almost over. We're almost there. We're almost there. We have to show off that blood splatter because it turned out better than Tom Six expected and we really want to show you how proud of him. No, Max, it's a visual metaphor. <laughs> it's his crown of blood it's behind how, his head. It's how mind-blowing this movie is. Yeah. Because she, get it? Because the last one's about to die and then she'll be stuck and it'll be like mind-blown. Can you imagine how horrifying this movie would have been if you cared about anything? Yeah. If we got to care and know for these characters, their goals, their dreams, their desires. But instead they were introduced as assholes. Not even assholes. I'd like, even if, if I hated them, it might be viscerally pleasing for me and just be like, yeah, fuck you. Yeah, I guess that's the real thing is that I don't hate them because I don't believe in them. Yeah. I don't believe in these frivolous, stupid girls who are like supposed to be frivolous and stupid because they thought a German boy was cute. Yeah. And then also are so clueless that they just get lost in the woods like that. Like that doesn't exist. I'm sorry. And also a question. Yeah. Another reason I don't believe that like this is supposed to be tragic. The skin that's like attaching her to the Asian guy's butthole. 
is the Asian guy's skin. Okay. So if she wants, she can just take a shard of glass and cut that off, and she's free from that point. I'm sure it would still hurt. I'm not saying it wouldn't, but I'm not. It it wouldn't be like cutting off your leg or something. It would be unpleasant. I think it would be better than dying in the middle of two corpses. Do you think she should try to get the phone right now? I mean, that wouldn't be a bad idea because at the very least, if it's like the U.S., if you call the emergency line and hang up, they're forced to send somebody. She really should have done that before. Yeah. She should have been, She should have hid the phone under the bed and just dialed mm-hmm. and left it, the receiver open. And then be there like, is a phone in his room. I thought you were making shit up. No. I pointed that to earlier. I'm like, why didn't she get the phone? It's right there. Yes, Jesus it's right Christ. in front of her. Yeah. She can do that. She can do that now. I don't know if she could do it now. I mean, she can't talk, but yet again. I, you'd have to move two corpses. It's going to be painful. It's going to be painful, but I think you could do it. I believe in her. More than Tom Six believed in making a good movie. Yeah. Would you say this is the worst movie we've done on the podcast? Do you think so? Um, I can't remember all the movies we've done. I know. We've done so many. I don't know because, like, I don't hate this movie. That's because, like, it, hating it seems like giving too much effort to it. Yeah, it's just, like, it is like a black hole. It's like this dense object that you just, like, everything goes around it. But it's like, I don't really have an opinion on it. Wizard of Gore had lower low points for me, I think, just because... Wizard of Gore is a better movie. Yes. Yeah. But that's because, like, yeah, you kept seeing the same stuff over and over again, but at yeah. least those kills were fun and silly. Yeah. And you, it, it, it relates more to a specific time and place yeah. that I find interesting compared to this, where this is basically... What does this tell you about, like, 2009 or the manner in which it was released? What can you extrapolate from it? Do, 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 yeah, you just extrapolate do, do, do. the fact that a human centipede is shocking yeah. as a premise, but that's it. Whereas, hum- you know, Wizard of Gore, you can... At least they show you gore. They they talk about, like, football sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. I I'm sorry, Brian. I think this might be my least favorite movie I've done on the show. Um, but I don't know. I think I think there were a lot I of think ways. I had fun, a fun time researching about how much of a dick Tom Six is um, <laughs> of just him preaching the metatextual qualities of his trilogy and how sure. big-brained he is for having that idea. Yeah. Um, Send me that link, by the way. <laughs> If and if Ryan, if that's what you're talking about, if you were expecting us to like be so intrigued by that premise that we're gonna keep going, I I don't know if we have it in us to keep doing that. I have heard the second one is objectively better as a movie. I can't remember it, so I can't back that up. But I I don't I don't have it in me to really just be like, fuck it, this is the worst movie ever, but Yeah. I really do not have opinions on it, which uh, is weird. Sh- shrug is yeah, my general it's opinion. It's kind of mine as well, but like a very hardcore shrug. Yes. Like I find it hard to focus on this movie. I would honestly, it's much easier for me to prepare for a movie like last year at Mary and Bad or like a Jean-Luc Godard movie than this movie. I would have a much easier time like going You're into s- that and making sense of it. I can see on your screen right now that we have the Rotten Tomatoes score of a rotten 50%, which is like right in the middle. And that's kind of where this movie is, where it's just like, this is so, yeah, middle of the ground that like, I can't, it's not so poorly made that that's interesting enough, but it's not competent in any sense of the word. So I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah. I, I, this is, I feel really bad. Because I am genuinely ecstatic that somebody would even consider <laughs> yeah. offering us money to talk about a movie. And Brian, I really hope that you keep listening after we talk <laughs> shit about the movie that you suggested to us for this entire time. Yeah. Because I value you as a listener and I value all of you who listen to our podcast. But 
I guess we should have put a disclaimer on that. If you do donate money, there is no guarantee that just because of course. you gave us money, we're going to talk good things about the movie that you told us to do. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is like, it's very weird to watch this movie and feel middle of the road and boring from a movie about people being a human centipede. <laughs> but really, it's the title is what it is to me. And that's it. It's the human centipede concept. How much do you get out of that concept? Could you find some sort of like Marxist idea of like consumerism or something from that? Yeah. But the movie doesn't explore that. However, movies that do explore that stuff like Sallow, stuff like other body harm movies like Society, like you said, are more interested in the class implications of like a hierarchical ordering and conjoining of bodies. So yeah, I would say check those out if yes. you haven't seen those already. Um, but yeah, that's really, <laughs> I really do not know what else to say about Human Centipede other than the fact that I probably will not watch this again ever. Yeah, same, honestly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, this has been. Yeah, the Spectator Film Podcast. And you can find more episodes at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. Uh, we will not do any more Human Centipede sequels. I'm sure. Unless you, if you donate forty dollars, no, then we'll do no, the second no, one. No, 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 no. Don't listen to Max. I know he makes those jokes about like if he has to go tackle a cassowary or whatever it is, something that would obviously kill him to the point where it's clear we're just making a bad joke. But seriously, maybe don't suggest Human Centipede Two. We will maybe add more. Uh, I don't know guidelines. Guidelines to that. Um, but again, just to reiterate, if you would like to suggest a movie for us to talk about, donate $20 or more to uh, onefairwage.org. One, I believe it's ofwemergencyfund.org. And uh, send the receipt to me at austin, dot spec, or austin at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or just through Instagram or whatever. And uh, let us know your name, what movie you want us to talk about, and a little synopsis of what you think of the movie, and we'll do our best to talk about it. Thank you.